uh, share my screen. Okay, so we are now recording and thank you very much, Jonathan, for agreeing to give a build a cell seminar and you can get started. Great, thank you. So first I wanna thank Kate and Aaron for, for um, inviting me to speak here. Um, so yeah, I'm John Schleybach. I'm an assistant professor of chemistry at uh, IU Bloomington. Um, and yeah, so I'm a junior PI. I started the lab uh, in 2016. Um, and so, you know, we've gotten, it's been fun. We've sort of followed our nose um, into some, and it's taken us into some new directions, which I never anticipated studying. So about me, I'm, uh, I trained as a biophysicist and studied membrane protein folding. Um, and in my postdoc years, I got interested in how this works in cells. And since opening my own lab, um, we've been thinking more generally about biosynthetic machinery, how it works, how it fails, and, and what that means for sort of biology, evolution, and disease. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about a pretty wild story where we started thinking just about membrane topology, um, and then it led us into this intersection with program ribosomal frame shifting. Um, and so today's talk, we're going to touch on everything from translocons and membranes to, you know, co-translational protein folding on the ribosome, translation kinetics, um, and uh, all sorts of things. So um, sort of bear with me. I hope you guys like this sort of adventure. Um, so my lab generally thinks about membrane protein biosynthesis in the cell. Uh, and specifically, we're interested in uh, eukaryotic cells most, mostly, um, and sort of how membrane proteins are made and how, how that um, you know, can work and how it can fail. So um, just as just general background here, right? This is the classic cartoon that you tend to see in textbooks where basically during translation of uh, a membrane protein in the early stages, as the first hydrophobic bits emerge, the ribosome is, is stalled by something called the signal recognition particle, which basically stalls translation and delivers um, the ribosome to the signal rep, uh, the, the SRP receptor into a, a machinery called the translocon, which is basically a pore in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. Once there, there's a GTP hydrolysis um, event um, and that basically releases SRP and uh, the ribosome continues producing the protein. As the, the hydrophobic bits come out, um, they go into the translocon and slide laterally into the membrane one by one, which establishes the orientation of the protein membrane or the topology, right? So this is an essential uh, prerequisite for proper folding and function for membrane proteins. And I think if you go back historically in the literature, everybody will tell you translo you know, you have these terms like uh, start transfer, stop transfer. Everybody thought that the translocon was some rational machine that recognized specific sequences. But it turns out if you fast forward and now we have all these beautiful cryostructures of ribosomes engaged with translocons and crystal structures of the translocons themselves. And what you'll basically see is as a nascent polypeptide comes out of the, of the ribosome, it basically encounters the SEC61 translocon in the membrane. And I should note, this is the same sort of structure and function that you find in bacteria where it's called SecYEG and archaea. So virtually every cell that you're ever going to find on the planet has translocons that look like this and act like this. And basically what they contain is this hydrated pore uh, called the protein conducting channel. And if you look at this from the top down, you'll see there's this little opening called the lateral gate that basically opens up and allows the polypeptide to have access to the membrane. Now, where originally people thought there was some signal, some recognition sequence in the amino acids uh, that this, this recognized, the truth of the matter is this just allows nascent peptides to explore the environment in the, uh, around the membrane and in the membrane, right? So this, this lateral gate allows peptides that are hydrophobic enough to slide into the membrane. So our lab is interested in the fact that this translocon, um, you know, engages thousands of different substrates in a cell. Uh, and they all have different shapes and sizes and hydrophobicities, but this is sort of a one size fits all mechanism. And oftentimes this fails and causes problems in so-called protein homeostasis. Now, our lab studies everything from GPCRs, transporters, ion channels, et cetera. Um, but through a collaboration with a virologist downstairs named Tuli Makopadai, uh, we got interested in these viral polyproteins. And this actually turns out to be why we get led in such interesting directions in this talk, because viruses know how to exploit these, mach these machineries and do fun things. And that's what we discovered inadvertently. The first thing Tuli asked me was, what do you think the topology of this protein looks like? Because this clade of viruses all has similar, you know, uh, topological signals in them. Um, and the topology that the, the, the field assumes was established by Heinrich Gerhoff in 1991 based on some classic molecular biology experiments. And so this, this region in the so-called 6K and E2 proteins of the virus um, is expected to have four transmembrane domains. But when I looked at this originally, it seemed kind of funny to me because 
there's a couple of segments here. There's supposed to be 12 or 13 amino acids crossing the membrane, which is just too short. Generally, you see 16 to 24 amino acids in a transmembrane domain. So I sort of approached this with an open mind, and we basically used some, started out with some informatic tools, which basically, this is a knowledge-based uh, predictor, which basically is trained on several thousand measurements of partitioning and peptides from the translocon into the membrane. So these negative peaks basically uh, suggest the positions of this, of this segment that are most likely to be recognized by the translocon and inserted in the membrane. And so you can see there's one, two, three, and kind of four segments if you squint. Um, one of them is sort of too polar looking to be a transmembrane domain. The other one is sort of too close to, a, to the third transmembrane domain. This segment is kind of frustrated. It's too long to be one TM domain. It's kind of too short to be two. So we tested these by introducing um, these, each of these segments into a so-called leader peptidase protein, which is, this is basically an engineered chimeric protein that allows you to measure how much, how efficiently a segment goes into the membrane. And so you can see basically here's a test segment in blue. Uh, if it slips through the translocon into the membrane, you get two glycans. If it goes into the membrane, you only get one glycan. Um, and so we basically produce this by in vitro translation and, and rabbit reticulocyte lysates that are doped with something called a rough microsome, which is basically a fragment of the ER that contains native translocons. And so you can see uh, when, you know, if we don't add any, any RNA, we get no signal. If we don't add membranes, you get this low weight band, which is basically untargeted protein that doesn't go in membranes. And if you add the microsomes, you get these gel shifts, which correspond to the glycosylation states. So for these two hydrophobic segments, TMs one and three, you'll see mostly you get this G1 band, which again is the, the, the helix in the membrane. Uh, and for the second domain, right, where it's sort of too polar, again, you see mostly this G2 product, which means it slipped through the translocon into the lumen. So our, consistent with the predictions, right, basically, and we also have data, I'm not showing here, showing that this, this, is, this, this helix isn't long enough to bend back and be, make a fourth helix. So based on both our biochemical predict, or our, our biophysical predictions and our biochemical measurements, we came up with the following topology, which is different than the other one. The other one had four TM domains in this red and, and orange, or sorry, in this green and orange region. And we're basically saying, nope, there's probably just two. Um, there's the segment, which is kind of hydrophobic, but not hydrophobic enough. And then there's these two really hydrophobic segments here. Um, now, this is in contrast with what the current virology community believes, but um, it actually made a lot of sense. If you look at the viral envelope, these are the envelope proteins, right? So this E1 protein and this E2 protein form this heterodimeric spike protein in the envelope. And so what you're looking at, actually, this E1 protein, which isn't something we're studying, is this yellow helix. And this red helix is this, what we have here in green. This segment, TM2, that we're saying is too you know, polar, actually forms interactions with capsid. And the virologist thought that this originally goes in the membrane and then comes out of the membrane somehow. But our data basically su suggests most of the time this doesn't go in the membrane. So, And also, I should note, you know, instead of having four helices when we have two, it still places the ectodomains in the ER lumen where they belong, where they get glycosylated and processed. So our data was perfectly consistent with the biochemistry literature and the structure literature, but it suggested a very different um, sort of topological pattern. I should note we validated this in cells with something called a glycosylatable GFP domain, which basically uh, it's a GFP that has extra glycosylation sites. So if this is projected in the cytosol, it's green. If you instead project it in the lumen, it gets glycosylated and it's not green. So we basically transfected this into hex cells and we, and we had constructs where we placed this sensor domain after each helix. And you can see that basically, uh, if we put it after TM1, it's in the cytosol and it's green. So the black, these are flow cytometry data. The black curve is basically cells that are not transfected with the sensor construct. The yellow, you see this gain in intensity suggesting that this part is in the cytosol. If you put it after this sort of two polar TM2 helix, you also see this increase in intensity. And if you put it either after the first minima or the second minima here, um, both of them basically have a, a loss of intensity suggesting that these are projected in the lumen where they get glycosylated. So again, we validated this in vitro, or sorry, in, in cells, um, and we tested it in vitro and we have calculations that all suggest this is the major topology. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Here's what we weren't expecting. The, my colleague, Tuli Mukopadai, studies the palmitylation of this segment because basically the palmitylation of these four cysteines is really critical for the assembly of the virus. And it turns out that in the main form of the protein shown here in the middle, there's no palmitylations on this cluster of cysteines. Uh, so you can see that here, basically, here's the protein, 
plus minus hydroxylamine, right? So hydroxylamine normally cleaves off palmitol groups. You can see there's no gel shift here suggesting the major form of this, right? These are not palmitolate, which makes sense because these are projected into the ER lumen. The palmitolation enzymes are in the cytosol. But there's a secondary form of this protein that's produced during translation by ribosomal frame shifting, where you actually do get these four cysteines palmitolated, right? So you can see here's the gel shift. You add hydroxylamine, it goes back down to the normal size. Now, this is perplexing because, again, there's two forms of this protein. These are differentially palmitolated. They're in the wrong compartment in the major form. And somehow these have to flip across the membrane in the minor form. And so I started thinking, what could possibly cause this? And I realized in our, in our biochemical measurements, about 20% of the time, this helix does go in the membrane, right? It's about an 80-20 split here. And if, you, if this helix flips in the membrane, it's going to invert the orientation of TM3 and allow these cysteines access to the cytosol. So we started, so, so first of all, let's talk about what causes these two forms of the protein. About 85% of the time, the ribosome chugs along and makes this whole polyprotein, right? So you have a capsid, this E3 protein, E2, 6K, E1. These are the two spike proteins, E2 and E1. But about 15% of the time, uh, during translation of the so-called 6K protein, the ribosome shifts out of frame and produces this transframe protein from the minus one reading frame. And so basically, again, you have sort of the zero frame codons. This, and here's your canonical slippery sequence that, that allows this. Basically, the tRNA, anticodons, and the codons, basically, they can shift out of frame and still maintain base pairing. And so, um, so basically, what you see is normally, right, there, you, you, you keep producing a zero frame protein, but occasionally you shift back one and you produce this set polypeptide. Now, um, we think that this corresponds to topology. When we proposed this, we didn't have any reason to believe this because I didn't actually know very much about ribosomal frame shifting, but our data suggests this possibility that we had to follow up on, which is basically say, most of the time when TM2 comes out of the ribosome, it's gonna skip onto the interface of the membrane and keep producing this full length polyprotein. But again, because of our you know, biochemical considerations, we thought, okay, maybe there's a minor topomer that forms where occasionally this TM2 is gonna slide down the translocon into the membrane in a probabilistic way. And that's gonna somehow coincide with ribosomal frame shifting, right? So there's some crosstalk between topology of the nascent, uh, of, the, of the zero frame and, or sorry, the topology of the nascent chain and the, the ribosomal frame shifting. So this, again, this, there was no reason to believe that this would be a thing, but it turns out this is easy to test, right? We can make mutations that change the probability of this helix going in the membrane and then just ask if the ribosome responds. And so basically we made two mutant versions of this where we mutated the helix upstream. We either put in two glutamates to make this probability of going in the membrane even lower, or we put in two leucines to make this look more like a regular transmembrane domain. And you can see again, here's our LEP assay just showing if you make the two leucines, you get more of the G1 band where the helix goes in the membrane. If you add two uh, glutamates, right, now you get more of this G2 product where uh, the helix is not in the membrane. Um, so, okay, so we wanted to see whether there's feedback to the ribosome, right? Um, and normally people do PRF assays with something called a dual luciferase uh, reporter, where basically you have a zero frame renal luciferase that's an expression, and then a minus one frame firefly luciferase that tells you how much frame shifting there is. The problem is you need this to be delivered to the ER membrane and processed properly. If you put something upstream of E3, you can interfere with the signal peptide getting recognized by SRP. So we, we made a different type of reporter basically where everything is native except um, downstream of the slip site. So you have a slip site and a stem loop here that stimulate ribosomal frame shifting. And basically we put a red fluorophore in the minus one frame uh, so that if you frame shift here, you produce a red fluorophore. We also put an IRES and a GFP downstream of this so that we could run this through a flow cytometer specifically gate on the green positive cells uh, that are expressing this reporter, and then ask how much of the red frame shift product we have. And so you can see here's flow cytometry data. Again, this is a distribution of several thousand single cell fluorescence measurements. Here's the mutation or the construct where we make mutations to slippery sequence to knock out frame shifting. Wild type shown in green here is, is above that baseline. If you add two leucines, you see a 30% increase um, in the, the frame shifting. And if you add two glutamates, you see uh, a 60% reduction or so. So these mutations are made uh, about a, uh, what is it? A couple hundred bases upstream of the, the frame shift site, but you do see feedback uh, that we would expect for this type of connectivity. 
Um, okay, so again, this was our model, right? Uh, in, in our data do suggest you can make mutations here, it's going to affect translation, decoding the slippery sequence, right? But the question is sort of how, how is there some feedback between what happens here and what happens uh, during catalysis, right? That's the, the question. And again, we, we were slash kind of are naive about how, how these things should be coupled. But um, one thing that was sort of serendipitous is in our field, uh, there's a bunch of groups in Sweden, Gunnar von Henna's sort of uh, people have been using arrest peptides as force sensors. So the idea is you have, an, there are specific arrest peptide sequences when the ribosome translate them, the ribosome stalls because they basically stick within the exit tunnel and you need a force to pull, you know, to dislodge that exit, uh, that, that arrest peptide. And when they do that, they basically found that there's this magic distance where if a, if a transmembrane domain goes into the translocon and turns the corner here, you're gonna dislodge that arrest peptide. And that happens in eukaryotic ribosomes with around, around with a force maximum around 40 to 45 amino acids. And so I thought, okay, well, you know, maybe this has to do with forces that happen, uh, mechanical forces on the nascent chain. And it just so happens the distance between the slippery sequence and alpha viruses uh, and that TM domain that we're talking about is never less than 43 and it's never more than 47 amino acids. So all these viruses have a very specific spacing that, that would coincide to a maximum force pulling. And so we tested this by basically making insertions and deletions in the loop region between the, the helix and the slip site. And you can see this is sort of, these are, these are uh, again, flow cytometry data just showing the statistical distribution of these measurements. Um, and so you can see, here's the wild type reporter with the 45 amino acids. This is for the Syndus virus, a very specific, you know, one of the alpha viruses. And if you, if you reduce the, the linker length, right, to 40 or 35 or 30, you, you see a reduction in the frame shift product here. This is just a you know, single cell distribution of the frame shift reporter intensity. And you can see it goes down if you decrease the linker length, it also goes down if you increase the linker length. And you can kind of see if you look at these median lines that um, the pattern that you see here is actually remarkably similar to the pattern that you see with the rest peptides, even though it's a completely different assay, a completely different context. So this gave us some, some confidence between changes in hydrophobicity and changes in linker length. This looks a lot like the types of force profiles that you see in arrest peptides. Um, only the out, output here isn't you know, reading through an arrest peptide. The output here is ribosomal frame shifting. So we wanted to explore this more. We thought of at first, how can we hook a bead up on this? How can we pull on the system? And the problem is because a membrane is involved, right? The two different topologies are on different sides of the membrane. Um, and so that's, you know, makes it really hard to think about how to, how to, uh, how to experimentally measure this. But we got lucky uh, in that um, our collaborator, Tom Miller, shown here at Caltech, uh, came up with a really nice coarse grain translation system where he basically coarse grained the exit tunnel, or sorry, the, yeah, the end of the ribosomal exit tunnel and the translocon. There's implicit water and bilayer solvent in this. Um, and you can see every three amino acids are rendered as a bead here. So this is basically a coarse grain molecular dynamic system that allows you to translate proteins. And because it's so simplified, you can reach physiological translation rates, right? So you can do this at the actual speed of translation. And you can make mutations that basically change the hydrophobicity of these beads and ask you know, what the outcomes of translation are. Um, so he had already benchmarked this for other LEP proteins and various other types of proteins and shown that this can recapitulate topology. And as we were coming up with this, he also showed that this can replicate force profiles from arrest peptide data. That was the key here. So we call up Tom, we asked him to, to look at the system. And sure enough, what he saw is our semi-polar TM2 domain here, it did have this frustration where sometimes it goes down the exit tunnel into the translocon, sometimes it skips out onto the membrane interface. So you can see this is number of beads in the translocon, which is basically how far down the translocon the nascent chain goes. You can see for the wild type here in this histogram that it's sort of bimodal. Sometimes it goes in the translocon, sometimes it doesn't. Our double leucine and double glutamate residues sort of, or mutation sort of push the, the probability back and forth that it's going to go in the translocon. And so then we sort of ask, okay, we can recapitulate the topology. Can we recapitulate um, forces? So we did a version of this. Um, hold on, let me switch my pointer off. Um, so we did a version of these simulations where basically we translated the proteins. So you're going to see the first TM domain come out in red. You can see how it sort of explores the translocon and the membrane. This is going to go through the lateral gate. And then the second one comes out. And then at the point where the frame shifting site is encountered, it's going to pause. It's going to stop translation. And it's going to measure force on the ribosome exit tunnel. 
um, as, as, the, as the nascent chain fluctuates. And so this allows us to look, when we make modifications, how is the force on the ribosome changing? And what these simulations basically showed us is that it doesn't, the, the, the double E and the double L mutant don't affect specific interactions that are going on here. What they do, do what they do in fact, is just to change the probabilities that the, the, the nascent chain is gonna go in the membrane, right? So for all three of these mutants, the further down the translocon, the, the nascent chain goes, the more the force goes up on the ribosome, right? Um, and so uh, what we found is when we simulated all of the mutants we had made, the things that change linker length and the things that change hydrophobicity, you can see from the core screen simulations, as force goes up, so too does the intensity of our fluorescent reporter and HEK293 cells. So given the coarseness of the simulation, I was pretty surprised to see that such a good correlation with our, our cellular data. Um, so, so if you put it together, what it sort of suggests is um, that, you know, again, the, you know, the, in this case, the virus has sort of evolved to have two topologies. This TM2 domain is, is, is energetically frustrated. Sometimes it, it doesn't engage the translocon at all. And sometimes it does engage the translocon. And when that happens, right, basically you go from having only two force spikes on the ribosome and to having a third force spike. And this third force spike coincides with the decoding of the slippery sequence in the RNA. Um, now, again, I don't come from the ribosome land um, and I'm learning about this. It's pretty interesting. Um, so there are still lots of questions, right? What, what, how is the force on the nascent chain affecting decoding? These are all things that we're interested in. But uh, for right now, um, you know, there's still obviously some open questions. One thing that we wanted to do to map this in sort of more molecular detail was to apply another technique we have in our lab called deep mutational scanning. And so uh, basically the idea is that we have this sort of, um, we have this uh, CRISPR modified HEK293 T cell line from Doug Fowler's lab at, at University of uh, Washington. And uh, basically they've been modified so they have a single um, at P um, recombination site in the genome and a defined locus. And so you take your, your construct of interest. So in this case, we have a plasmid that has our you know, frame shift reporter cassette that we programmed in about 7,000 mutations sort of before the slippery sequence, in the slippery sequence, and after. And basically you transfect those into the cells with the BXB1 recombinase, and it'll install one copy of the plasmid into the genome per cell, um, and right next to an inducible reporter. So what you end up with is a, a mixed recombinant stable cell line where every cell expresses a different variant of your reporter construct from a common genomic locus. And then basically you run the cells through fluorescence activated cell sorter, and we can basically sort the cells out based on whether they give you, you know, the mutant they express gives you more frame shift signal or less frame shift signal or somewhere in between. You take those cells and you apply deep sequencing to track which mutants give you more or less signal, and you can reconstruct for each of these roughly where they fall on this intensity coordinate. So what I'm going to tell you is basically, you know, all of the mutants we've had, we're going to break it down by region of the transcript and show you sort of at really high resolution, sort of what types of mutations affect this process and what that means. So first the diagram, so again, this is our fluorescence reporter, has everything native upstream, it's just this minus one fluorophore. And this is the region we mutagenize, ranging all the way from the beginning of the first transmembrane domain through the, through the slippery site and the, the RNA structure, which we're going to talk more about. Um, and, and again, all of this is, you know, we, we introduced sort of NNN codon level mutants at each position. It's about 125 amino acids. So here's a flow cytometer data. You can, you can see basically if you recombine in the wild type cassette, you get this black curve here, which this is the ratio of the frame shift signal to the, the expression reporter, the IRES EGFP. You can see, you know, the distribution among the recombinant cells sort of skews lower, which means there's some of these variants kill the signal. A lot of them are neutral, and there's a few of them that actually improve the frame shift and the efficiency. So again, I'm going to break this down, you know, region by region. The first thing I'm going to focus on is the RNA structure, which has traditionally been the focus of most PRF investigations. Again, most of the time, the ribosome encounters a slippery sequence, and there's some sort of structure here, whether it be a stem loop or a pseudonaut. And basically, what that does is it stalls the ribosome as it's trying to decode this slippery sequence. And so as the ribosome solves, there's more time for that tRNA to wiggle and explore different reading frames. And so, you know, this basically, it's the encounter of the stem loop that allows the tRNA to move. And we know from our experiments, if you, if you delete that uh, downstream RNA segment, frame shifting goes away. It's just that the pulling on the nascent chain seems to make the efficiency go way up. So what happens when we make mutations in this region? So here's the native 
uh, sequence of the transcript. Um, and so basically at the slip site and downstream of the slip site, we're rationalizing this in terms of the, the transcript structure because this hasn't been translated at the point of frame shifting. And so you can see basically here's every mutation. The black squares are sort of the wild type sequence, right? And, and basically each other square is a measurement for the effect of the mutation on frame shifting. Red basically means you get more frame shifting. Blue means you get less. White means it's the same as wild type. So you can see basically in the slippery sequence itself, um, virtually any mutation you make is going to decrease frame shifting. We know that's true, right? And you can also see if you go from one mutation to two to three, you see this sort of stepwise decrease in the frame shifting efficiency. And that makes sense because again, if you make mutations here uh, and there's a ribosomal frame shift, right? You might not get perfect phase pairing in the minus one frame. And so basically there's an energetic penalty to frame shifting. And so you can see whether you mutate the UU4, or UUA, right? You see this slip, slippery sequence is essential for this, as we know. Um, but downstream, right, you see these two sort of um, regions where um, there's this sort of blue footprint, right? And these actually correspond really nicely to the two halves of the stem loop that have already been experimentally characterized. So um, there's, there's a couple of groups that have uh, explored this, Atkins group and other virology groups that have uh, looked at both sort of frame shifting assays with sort of tiny chunks of the, of the transcript um, or with sh things like shape that map the RNA structure. So you can see like this is, you know, when they, when you run RNA predictions, there's sort of more than one predicted stem that can form here. So here's, you know, potential stems one, two, and three. Now potential stem one is actually the one, this is from one of Atkins review showing this is what the accepted stem loop structure is. And indeed, you can see that there's more reduction in frame shift when you mutate this parts of the stem. If you project our data onto this stem one structure, it looks like this. So, so basically, almost anywhere, almost anywhere in this stem, if you mutate out the base pairing, uh, you see a reduction in, in frame shifting. I should note there's one CA mismatch in the stem. And we find that if you make the mutant that makes a GC base pair actually does increase frame shifting. Uh, and the mu mutation that makes an AU base pair actually doesn't have much of an effect at all. So um, this sort of matches our expectations. The stability of the stem loop should should in some ways affect sort of the, the, the propensity of this um, secondary structure to stall the ribosome. Okay, let's shift gears to upstream. So here in yellow, this is the slip site. If you look every at everything upstream of the slip site, and in this case, I'm going to cast this in terms of the amino acid sequence, because this has all been translated at the point where the ribosome encounters the slip site. So you can see here's the native amino acid sequence. And on the Y coordinate here, you can see every possible substitution arranged from hydrophobic at the top to polar at the bottom. Um, and you can see basically there's a ton of mutations upstream of the slip site that uh, decrease or increase the, the efficiency of frame shifting. It seems to be highly tunable. Um, by you know making mutations in the nascent chain, right? So first, let's focus on our favorite sort of semipolar helix here and look at the trends that we see. First thing I'll note is when we came into this, based on our original paper, uh, we thought that this was all just going to be about hydrophobicity. Um, so if you look at this, is a computational estimates for the effects of every possible mutation on um, the probability of of the helix going from the translocon to the membrane. And you can see basically, if this was just a thermodynamic effect, we'd, we'd expect that almost every substitution that gives you a polar charge residue is going to decrease membrane integration and decrease frame shifting. But when we look at our actual results, they're not the same at all, right? Here's the native sequence, and here's every possible mutation. You can see actually polar mutations only seem to have a real effect towards the C-terminal portion of this helix, right? So this to me suggests that this isn't just about hydrophobicity. There's something going on in the translocon, some sort of structural contact that's affecting this, right? And you don't get that from just thermodynamic estimates, but you do get that from the coarse grain simulations from Tom Miller. So here's what I'm saying. So this is basically standard deviation of delta LG, basically showing you which residues are most sensitive in terms of the thermodynamic effect of mutations on membrane integration. And you can see, as expected, the mutations in the center of the helix are the most touchy when it comes to hydrophobicity. And here in black, this is actually our frame shift sensitivity, right? It's not, there's a disconnect between the, the thermodynamics and the observed frame shifting. But Tom actually was able to, to run uh, coarse grain simulations on all 440 or so mutations in this helix. And what he found is just like what we see with frame shifting here in black, this is the sensitivity of frame shifting mutations as a function of residue. We see the C-terminal residues are most touchy in his simulation in terms of pulling force, right? So if you're, if you're looking at hydrophobicity, there's a disconnect. If you're looking at pulling forces in the simulation, it is the C-terminal portion of the helix that's important. 
So we wanted to know what was going on here. Why? Why is he terminal portion? And what we know is that we made an atomistic model based on a, on a cryostructure of the, a translocation intermediate that's in a similar sort of pose. And what we found in atomistic and in coarse grain simulations is at this point in frame shifting, this helix is just starting to push out of the translocon into the membrane. The N-terminal portion is partially solvated by lipids. So you can see basically the root mean square fluctuation in these simulations for the N-terminal portion is, you know, pretty dynamic. But the C-terminal portion is still stuck in the lateral gate and is basically, you know, it's, it's ba basically has lower fluctuations because it's stuck in the lateral gate. You can see this again for the, for both the atomistic time scales and the coarse grain where everything's a bead, the C-terminal uh, residues as helix are, are not fluctuating because they're stuck in the translocon. And it was also nice to see that there's a helical sort of this, this periodicity here that has to do with the helical turns in the helix. So again, we get that in the atomistic simulation. We don't get in the core screen, but you see the, the net effect is the C-terminal portion of this helix is still stuck in the translocon. And it just so happens, if you look at the average effect of charge residues, right, residues that are most touchy in our, in our measurements map onto those residues that are projected to be stuck in the translocon. We think that this is basically a hinge point, right? Where this, you know, whether this pops into the membrane or doesn't is going to determine whether the force is transduced back to the ribosome. So we're pretty excited to see that. Okay, what else is going on here? There's a lot going on in the exit tunnel. This was a shock to us. It still is a shock to us because we thought that there shouldn't be too much structure in the exit tunnel, um, right? There, I mean, there are instances where you can see folding in the exit tunnel, but usually it's a couple helical turns here or there, right? But it turns out this is very touchy. And so we were trying to think about what's going on here. And what we realized is if you, if you, instead of looking at amino acid sequence, which we show on this plot, if you break this down by individual codons, right? And you sort those codons based on tRNA abundance. So remember we're in HEC 293 T cells. There's data in the literature about how each of these, um, you know, the codons that decode these, uh, or sorry, the tRNA that decode these codons, we know about relative abundance. So if we, if we break this down by codon, we sort by abundant tRNA or non-abundant tRNA, what you tend to see is there's about a 22 codon stretch where codons that are decoded by rare tRNA are tolerated, but ones that are decoded by high abundance tRNA are not tolerated. And this to us suggests that this maybe doesn't have to do with structure so much as it does translation kinetics, right? Uh, tRNA abundance determines how quickly the ribosome will mow through an area. Um, and so we were curious about this, about whether it had to do with folding. And so what we did is we repeated our coarse grain translation simulations with a variable translation rate. And so the first thing I'm showing you on the left here is the basically the probability that TM2, the polling helix, is going to go into the membrane. And what we found is you can slow translation down or speed it up all you want. It's not going to affect the equilibrium propensity of this helix to go in the membrane, right? That makes sense. But if you just ask about how, what, you know, how much force is going to be on the ribosome at the point of frame shifting, what you do see is that this force on the ribosome trends up as translation slows. So that's one piece of evidence basically suggesting that if you, if you speed up translation in this, in this area, right, you might affect the probability of the helix to go into the translocon and pull. The other thing that we're starting to realize also is, right, this, the translation being slow in this region also provides time for that, that stem loop to refold, right? So if the ribosomes are mowing through it, they're gonna, they're gonna mow through that structure and it needs enough time to reform before the next ribosome comes to frame shift. So teasing apart the effects of mutations in this region is quite challenging, but I think it's pretty interesting nonetheless to, to see that this region is very, um, very important um, for the overall frame shifting efficiency. Okay, so you put it all together. What it basically says is in this viral system, which has evolved to do this, right? We know that this TF protein is a virulence factor. It's important for the infectivity of the virus. And we know that you know, nature has, has evolved to do this on purpose. And what the virus has found out is it can tune this, the, the probability of this event by basically either A, affecting the stem loop stability, right? Um, or B, affecting pulling forces that occur on the nascent chain at the point of frame shifting. We're still trying to understand whether there are other cellular factors that play into this, right? This could be a way to get around interferon responsive frame shift repressors like shiftless, um, there could be, you know, whatever, uh, lots of, you know, other things that affect uh, frame shifting efficiency, um, you know, whether it be chaperones or all sorts of other things. So I, I think basically, again, these mechanistic sh studies show us that the virus has another trick up its sleeve. What it's there for, I don't really know. Um, but 
one thing that was sort of gratifying after we published these studies, right, we got a lot of pushback and peer review about this because, again, we kind of treat the, the ribosome like a black box, right? I'm not a ribosome guy. I get it, right? Like we, we could have done a little more mechanistic work on what's going on in the ribosome, um, but we're not there yet, right? Um, so suffice it to say, most people were skeptical. It was nice to see, though, after we published this, that there was this nice paper that came out in science last year from then advanced group that basically they did a cryostructure of a stalled ribosome uh, during the, you know, during the decoding of the slip site in SARS-CoV-2. And surprisingly, what they found is that there is a zinc finger in the NSP10 protein that folds in the exit tunnel. Uh, you can see here's an overlay of the NSP10 crystal structure and the nascent chain in their cryo model. And what they found is if you mutate the contacts between that folded zinc finger and the ribosome, you also see a change in frame shifting. So this is very different, right? Here we're talking about transmembrane domains. There they're talking about the folding of a, of a small soluble domain in the exit tunnel. But the truth of the matter is, whether you're talking about translocons, whether you're talking about folding of soluble domains, whether you're talking about chaperone interactions, there are lots of things that are known to pull on ribosomes during translation. It's just had never really been connected to frame shifting efficiency before, so far as I'm aware. There are plenty of examples where people had shown, well, I shouldn't say plenty, a couple of examples where people had shown nascent chain structure indirectly affects rib, you know, the ribosomal frame shifting. It's just now we have this connection to pulling force. So moving forward, and I'm almost done. I'm going to wrap up with stuff that I think maybe you guys would be more interested based on what Kate said. Um, we sort of asked the question, can we make another protein frame shift? Is this specific to the viral protein? Is the virus just showing us something interesting? And so we wanted to see if we could program this in vitro, right? One of the things we're interested in is synthetic biology. We don't know much about synthetic biology, but it would be nice if we could engineer sort of tunable translation circuits. Um, and so we, we stopped to ask whether we could, you know, build in a PRF site from the ground up. And so we started with a very naive design. We took the leader peptidase protein that I'd shown you we use in our biochemical assays. And we simply installed a, a slippery sequence in the RNA, RNA which is a, 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 is a poly, or poly, uh, poly A track in the, in the RNA. Um, and we put it sort of at this magic distance of 45 codons away from the C-terminal edge of that, uh, of our H segment sort of guest, you know, TM domain. And so we basically made it in our um, in vitro translation system, right? So basically the idea of this is if you translate the full link protein, there's going to be some untargeted protein that doesn't make it to the membrane. And there's going to be a glycosylated version of this protein that's in the membrane that gets this sort of downstream sequence, right? But if instead there's a frame shift, right, you're going to hit a minus one stop codon, you're going to cut off about 80 amino acids, right? So this will be a smaller product if you frame shift. And so we, again, simplest design. We already had this construct. We put in a hydrophobic transmembrane domain. And we basically just introduced a slippery sequence in the transcript. And we were shocked to see, honestly, the first time we tried this, it happened. So here you can see uh, no RNA, right? No signal with no RNA. Um, and then we basically have a couple of markers. And I apologize. I know this data is preliminary. So this, this is the first time I ever showed it. So we have basically a construct where we mutated out the slippery sequence. So we should suppress uh, PRF. You can see this is the, the migration of the full length product, right? We see a little bit of frame shift product here because it's really hard to actually completely kill frame shifting. Um, most people in the field will show you that. Um, and then here's a construct where we basically just knocked the, the frame, you know, we, we made a mutation here so that the zero frame would hit the same stop code on. You can see, so here's the, the migration of the frame shift product. And so here's the test construct, which basically has this design, right? Just a slippery sequence, 45 amino acids away. And you can see there's a major frame shift band here. It's about a 50-50, right? So 50% of the time, it's going to frame shift here and stop. The other 50% of the time, it's just going to read through and, and translate the full length protein. So this was pretty shocking. We, we Again, based on what we know, there should be this distance dependence. And lo and behold, if we move the slip site to the 35 amino acids away or to 55 amino acids away, you can see now you get just the full length product, at least within the range of this assay, right? You don't get any of this low weight frame shift product. Um, now, again, based on what we know from the viral system, we thought, okay, maybe another way that we can tune this is by tuning the hydrophobicity of the helix. So we swapped out our, our hydrophobic segment, which is mostly like leucines, polyleucines with a couple of alanines, to something that's basically polyalanines with a couple of valines. Now, this is not efficiently recognized by the translocon, but you see almost the same trends, right? If you put the slip side at 35 amino acids, right, you get full length protein. If you put it at 45 amino acids, you get the frame shift product. If you put it at 55 amino acids, I'm sorry, codons, I should be saying codons on amino acids. 45 codons, you get the full length product, right? So there's this magic distance between 
this TM domain and a slippery sequence that, that seems to do this. Now, I should note, um, when I got into this, I didn't think, I thought we would need RNA structure to do this. I thought we would need to pause the ribosome, but it doesn't seem to be the case in vitro. My best guess is that in, when we do re rabbit reticulocyte lysate, everything's diluted, including the tRNA. So it might be that just in vitro, this is already slow and you don't need a stem loop. But we're about to go in vivo to test that. And we're about to make constructs where we introduce sort of structured RNA regions to see if that improves the efficiency at all or not. Um, I should note our collaborators sort of corroborated this. They did more simulations. So this is the protein, right? Here's sort of an intermediate frame. And they sort of showed that, you know, again, whether you have this hydrophobic segment in blue or, or sort of less hydrophobic segment in red, pulling forces on the ribosome at our distance are not that different. But their predictions did suggest if we flip the orientation of the, of the protein, the membrane, um, we should see more dependence on this. So here's our native orientation. You can see the luminal domain is in, is in the ER uh, side, right? So regardless of whether we have a hydrophobic or polar helix, it's going to go through the translocon because the loops are pulling them that way. So you can see whether you have more hydrophobic up here in dark green or more less hydrophobic or even polar here in the dark red. You see the force profile is sort of similar. There are some differences, but not a lot. But if you flip this upside down, now the helix has a choice about whether it's going to go in the, into the translocon or skate out in the interface like the viral system. And here you can see the force should be very dependent. More hydrophobic sequence give you lots of pulling force, whereas everything else gives you sort of minimal pulling force. So we're about to try this where we basically invert the topology of LEP and ask whether we can tune uh, frame shifting by simply changing the topology and or hydrophobicity of this segment. So uh, just a quick recap, right? We got into this asking questions about the topology of this, of this viral system, right? And we found that the virus basically has evolved to exploit uh, the translocon, right? It gives you more than one topology, more than one structure. And we found that again, by doing this, it can tune um, the efficiency of ribosome the frame shifting. And finally, you know, our in vitro work is basically showing us it's actually much easier to do this uh, sort of thing than, than one would expect, right? The normal error rates in translation are 10 to the minus fourth. Um, but, you know, in this case, if you put this slip site in the right spot, you're going to get pretty, you're, you're going to reduce that, that fidelity by orders of magnitude. I should also note, we looked in native, in, in uh, biological transcriptomes for this, you know, slip sites at the magical distance, and they're threefold less common than you would, you would expect to find uh, randomly. So nature does seem to know about this. Um, and we're finding some in, in interesting biological examples where this may play new functions. So with that, I would like to conclude. Wes Penn, um, shown here, is a technician that's helped from the beginning with this project, and Chuck Koontz did all of the computational work in terms of analyzing RNGS. Haley Harrington, shown here, did the viral work, um, and this is Matthew Zimmer. He did the computational stuff at Caltech. Uh, and Patrick Carboni did the mutational scan, and Diatima did the, the in vitro uh, you know, protein engineering or frame shift engineering stuff. Um, so with that, I'd like to take any questions. Sorry, I know I see the chats going up, but um, I didn't want to get too far off track. So anyway, thank you for your attention and for the opportunity. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you have a lot of questions in chat. Okay. Should we just go uh, through them you, one by one? Yeah, go go through them. And if you could read them for the people that will watch sure. the recording, that would be great. Yeah. So the first one is, is the topology one PRF interaction and eukaryotic only or universal translation system effect. So there are, um, I don't think it's eukaryotic only. You can, you can actually take the HIV uh, gag pole frame shifting cassette and put it in E. coli and it'll frame just frame shift just fine. The only thing that's different in terms of translocon. So Gunnarun Hen has shown that the length of the exit tunnel is different for eukaryotic and prokaryotic ribosomes. Um, and so what you see is the length dependence of that force on the ribosome. Um, in terms of the transmembrane domains I was talking about, it's different. It's, it's like 35 versus 45. Um, but otherwise, the principles are the same. Um, in terms of whether we've done prokaryotic experiments, the answer is no. But I suppose that's one thing we, we will probably get along to, I mean, to trying with the leader peptidase construct. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one. Could you please explain the frame shift assay a bit more? How do you switch from, uh, from firefly or no elisophrase to one base frame shift? So yeah, so we we have worked with the <coughs> excuse me, um, we have worked with the luciferase assay, but in this case we're not doing luciferase. We're doing this fluorescence reporter for reasons that I kind of alluded to in terms of you know we can't have a five prime cassette here for expression because it'll it'll mess up targeting of the polyprotein. Um, so we avoided dual luciferase for that reason. 
So it's a very simple idea, right? We have, we control for expression because A, um, you know, we have this downstream IRS GFP that allows us to gate on cells that have a uniform expression level um, at the, in the flow cytometer. Um, and, you know, in the deep mutational scanning, we, we also know that the expression can't change that much because we have a, you know, it's expressions being driven off of this uh, inducible promoter in the genome, and there's only one copy of it. So we don't have transient expression artifacts or copy number artifacts. Um, so this is basically the best we can do. In our new paper, which is under review at NAR, um, that, uh, you know, the, the, the demutational scanning stuff, we sort of show that there's a difference between our fluorescence reporter and the traditional dual lucifrase. And again, we sort of show that this is because the topology gets screwed up when you make a five prime fusion. Um, I hope that answered the question. Uh, could you speculate if any ribosome mutations could change the sensitivity of protein mutation by slipping anything like exit tunnel mutation maybe? So we are interested in what mutations are doing in the exit tunnel. We do think that there is probably a folding the exit tunnel component because one of the things I didn't talk about is that segment in the exit tunnel that's really sensitive mutations. Um, there's also hydrophobicity uh, that tracks with it, right? So polar mutations are not tolerated in there. And we know from other work that hydrophobic mutations tend to form helical structure in the exit tunnel. So that's one thing that we're sort of interested in is whether the formation of a helix in that might affect the propagation of the force to the peptidyl transferase center, but we're not sure about that. Um, okay, is there any way to turn on slipping on and off with some trigger, like a small molecule? Yes, we're trying, we're trying for that. Um, Fantastic artificial evolution and build up. Okay, so um, I'll just give you a sneak peek because I'm all for transparency. I don't actually, I don't have these data with me, but one thing I will say on this, um, when we saw netted bands um, uh, paper here, right? One of the natural questions you would ask is whether this is sensitive to zinc, right? Because a lot of zinc fingers fold upon binding. Um, in their paper, they show that the cysteines in their model are not, they're splayed out in a way that wouldn't allow for coordination of zinc. But, you know, this is single particle picking when you do cryo reconstructions and, you know, it's a biochemical system. So one thing that I'm sort of suspicious about is whether there are conditions in the cell, whether they be metallo chaperones that co-translationally metallate things or whether, you know, zinc, you know, absolute free zinc concentrations affect this. I am suspicious that, you know, there's some feedback here. And we are looking into this both in SARS-CoV-2 and in HIV. I can tell you right now, it looks like the cysteines that are in the zinc fingers, HIV has uh, NCP7 zinc fingers in the exome. It looks like if you make mutations of those cysteines, it does affect frame shipping. So I suspect that we're going to find that this can be made tunable by putting small domains that bind small molecules. That's something we want to do once we get done with this transmembrane domain business. Nobody likes working with membranes, so hopefully we can get out of that. <laughs> um, and again, like my suspicion is there's lots of things that are sort of pulling on, on these and, and tuning this. Um, okay, let me see here. The in vitro data is fascinating. Is it rabbit or E. coli system? It's a rabbit reticulocyte. That's what we, we work with. Um, we haven't tried anything else just because that's what we know and love. Um, if glycosidation is necessary, would you be able to speculate if bacterial system with artificial glycosidation work too? Um, I don't know if glycosylation is necessary, actually. We mostly just use that as a marker for which species are in the membrane because the, you have that luminal OST that, that adds the glycans. That would be an in interesting experiment to do. I, I have no idea, to be honest, whether that actually influences it or not, but it'd be kind of hard to quantitatively control that. Um, it turns out that OST, the enzymes that add glycosylation are sort of substoichiometric with translocons. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of people know that, but Frederick Forster from, um, from Germany has done some really nice cryo-EM tomography showing that translocon complexes are pretty heterogeneous. Um, okay, so one from Derek. It might be a weird question, but it kind of follows up on Aaron's question. Would introducing artificial hydrophobic domain protein or, mem or like membraneless co co coacervate? I don't know what that is actually. Can somebody explain? Um, could it turn on the slipping? Um, I think, yeah, again, I think, I think it could, you know, this is anecdotal and I probably shouldn't even mention this because we're still investigating these things. But one thing that we're finding when we look at natural transcriptomes is there's some slippery sequences that form these uh, consensus PRF motifs we found uh, when splicing goes wrong. So I'm sort of, again, another one of our wild hypotheses, which again, this is completely speculative. When we look through transcriptomes, there's, there's some slip, slippery sequences that when they get put in the wrong place, 
they're next to a TM domain. And I'm, I'm wondering whether that's a sensor that gets rid of um, aberrant um, uh, RNA transcripts. I'm not sure though, because if you PR, most of the time when, when PRF happens, you hit a minus one stop codon and that can trigger no-go decay, uh, nonsense media decay, uh, lots of other quality control pathways involving ribosome collisions. And so I suspect this is tied into lots of other networks and that nature can use this for lots of purposes. But again, I know that I'm well outside of the mainstream here and I don't have a lot of data yet to, to convince you of that. So I'll take that with a grain of salt. Um, okay, oops, sorry. Uh, let's see. Could you speculate what is the evolutionary advantage of this slipping mechanism in viruses? It makes sense, but why would this mechanism persist in eukaryotic ribosomes or is it just a byproduct? So I, okay. Um, I'll give you guys another, again, because I'm all for transparency. One of the things that we found in the natural transcriptomes, um, sorry, I'm going to flip through a bunch of slides I have buried here. Um, we looked in transcriptomes for where you find this sort of helix slip site. And again, there's no, we didn't look for RNA structure yet. I have no reason to believe that these are all, I'm, I'm sure most, there's a lot of false positives here. But what we found in, you know, several hundred eukaryotic transcripts have this is there's certain uh, biochemical functions where you do see an enrichment of these things. So this is basically went into the um, uh, gene ontology um, CAG database and we assigned all these transcripts. And one of the things that, that caught my eye is ABC transports here because we study um, this protein called CFTR, which is prone to misfolding. It's prone to co-translational misfolding specifically. So mutations in this cause cystic fibrosis. And what we found when we looked in this is that there are actually like upwards of 12 or 13 slippery sequences and there's a cluster of them in, in the second nucleotide binding domain. Um, and so again, this is a project that we are actively working on, but my suspicion is we've, we've shown that with the dual cephrase assays that um, there's three slippery sequences in, in one of its domains and um, that they're active basically. There's RNA structure and it, and it is an active motif. And we're still trying to, I'm not 100% confident in these because there's some reporter artifacts we're trying to be very careful with. But in one of the versions we've seen, so here's a dual cephrase, right? Here's your expression reporter, and here's your minus one firefly that tells you frame shift signal. One of the things we found is when the mutations that cause co-translational misfolding, it doesn't affect expression of the reporter system, but it has a huge effect on frame shifting. So this mutation is several kilobases upstream from the frame shift site. But basically, you know, what we think is happening is that when, when folding goes wrong, whether it be from a mutation or some oxidative stress or chaperones going low. Basically, we think that's going to lead to pulling and an increase in frame shifting. We have some empirical evidence for that, but we have a lot of work to do to, to show that sort of uh, in, in a very, you know, super convincing way that's not an artifact, right? So, you know, people argue about these frame shift reporters all the time, and I don't want to get caught up in some technical controversy. So we've been very careful with this, but, you know, basically, I mean, I have a summary slide here. My, my main thought about why these would be in eukaryotic systems is because I, I see them as sort of traffic lights, right? If, if everything's going fine, right? These, these keep going about their business. But if there's a frame shift, new chaperones binding, right? Things going wrong. We know from Liz Miller's work, MRC, that this can induce ribosome collisions and ribosome collisions can create no-go decay, right? But they don't know, they know empirically that mutations that cause misfolding cause sort of premature termination and degradation of the transcript, but they don't know how. What I think is basically, you know, the, the nature of this feedback is ribosomal frame shifting. So these sites where basically the ribosome slows down. And if things are going wrong in the nascent chain, basically tugs on the nascent chain and causes frame shifting, which would provide an opportunity for transcript degradation and or, you know, the termination, premature termination of translation for misfolded protein. Again, this is all highly speculative. So, you know, I take it with a grain of salt, but that's my thought, right? I think for a long time, no one looked at eukaryotic systems because in viruses, right, they have tiny genomes and they want to maximize sort of the amount of proteins they can encode. So they use the minus one frame. And you can see in those systems, right, this, this ribosome pile up and, you know, switching reading frames, you can see it. And you can also see open reading frames that are in, you know, that are in different reading frames. So it's obvious in viruses that they do this. It's not so obvious in eukaryotic systems, but what I think is, again, that this is just a sensor for, for aberrant protein folding. Um, but time will tell, I suppose. Um, anyways, that was, that was a long-winded an answer, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, that was really fascinating. That was actually a question that I wanted to ask myself before um, Peter got to it first. Um, why the hell does that system exist? Um, it, and I guess, um, 
following up on whose question was it? Um, Derek's question about uh, membraneous organelles, uh, since he didn't mm. uh, elaborate. I I was wondering about that myself. Um, you know, we can engineer phase transition uh, proto organelles, things like intrinsically disordered domains that phase transition, um, and they can create kind of a fake ad hoc uh, hydrophobic environment. I wonder if that could be possibly a mechanism to turn on and off some sort of a, like a hypermutation time when you turn on yeah. slip and then turn off slip. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. And I know that like, you know, there are people that are showing that there are sort of like, I did see a paper, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember who the author authors were, but there was a paper recently that showed there's sort of sub parts of the cell where frame shifting happens more readily than others, which did suggest that there's some spatial control over ribosome frame shifting. But yeah, oh. I, I, it would be fascinating to see whether that is connected to sort of membraneless organelles. And I mean, of course, everybody knows RNA is one of the key drivers of that. So I wouldn't be surprised yeah. at all, but, um, and I'd be really interested in exploring that if anybody has ideas. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. I would love to know the answer to. <laughs> yeah, that, that's super cool. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of work in synthetic cell field on membraneless organelles right now, because it's a good mm -hmm. way for us to engineer subcellular controllability. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, one would have to think that tRNA abundance would be different in those punk day, right? Um, and that would affect yeah. translation kinetics in a way that might make frame shifting easier. Um, but I don't know. Um, I, I'm, yeah, it's a good question. That's super cool. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> if no one has any more questions, I want to thank Jonathan again. And thank you, everyone else. All right. And see I appreciate you. appreciate all the questions. See you next thanks week. And thanks yep. again. Thanks, Kate. Bye.